This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we continue to cover Israel's bombardment of Gaza, we're joined by two guests, one a Holocaust survivor, the other one of the world's leading genocide scholars. Omer Bartov is a professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University. He's the author of numerous books, including most recently Genocide, the Holocaust in Israel-Palestine, First-Person History in Times of Crisis. He is an Israeli-American scholar who's been described by the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum as one of the world's leading specialists on the subject of genocide. He recently signed an open letter warning of Israel committing a potential genocide in Gaza. We're also joined by Marion Ingram. She's an 87-year-old Holocaust survivor who's been protesting outside the White House, calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Longtime activist who was an organizer with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, in the 1960s. She's the author of The Hands of War, a tale of endurance and hope from a survivor of the Holocaust, and Hands of Peace, a Holocaust survivor's fight for civil rights in the American South. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, we're going to begin with Marion Ingram. Uh, before we talk about the ceasefire in Gaza, I'd like you to respond to the censuring of the only Palestinian-American member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib, whose speech we just played. I totally uh, support uh, her comments. And I think it is, on top of that, shameful that her justified defense of human lives is considered anti-Semitic. It is pro-human beings. I find it horrific that the politicians have the nerve to censure righteous voices for peace and for the lives of Gazans who are being murdered. It is slaughter that is happening. And Rashida Talib is, in my eyes, a hero. Uh, Netanyahu's government or uh, Israel's policies for decades has been the suppression of Palestinians, land grabs, uh, deprivation of Palestinians. It is painful for me, as, uh, as someone who has experienced all of the terrors that Gazans are experiencing, and even the uh, horrific attacks in Israel by Hamas. But uh, Hamas his attack on Israel does not justify the slaughter of women and children, especially children. I was a child of war. I have experienced all of these things. I have also, I've also known for a fact that what Israel is doing will not end this conflict. It will only exacerbate it. It will increase resistance to anything. I think that Biden needs to defund uh, all of the money that is given to Israel. I think he should not only call for a ceasefire, I think he needs to start thinking about peace. We cannot continue to make wars and then call for ceasefires only to have wars start again after the ceasefire ends. We've experienced this over and over and over again. I am so tired of having to protest everything, wars, gun violence, the war against women. It is ridiculous that we are not able to think clearly. My husband has an expression, and that is all about the Benjis. I think that uh, the happiest people in the universe must be the manufacturers of armaments. Uh, and, and probably are also complicit in the promotion. The fact that, that the United States is complicit in this murder of children 
is to me a horrific uh, indictment of inhumanity. And I applaud uh, Rashida Tlaib with all of my heart, with all of my being. Uh, I think she's fantastic. I just wish that there were more voices uh, to join her uh, in uh, the House. Uh, Marion Ingram, I wanted to ask you, you grew up in uh, Hamburg, Germany in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Could you tell us uh, and to our audience some of your experiences that shaped and determined and, and uh, made you want to participate in these protests in Washington against the, uh, the Israeli bombardment and invasion of Gaza? Uh, because I, uh, well, I am a Jew, my mother was a Jew. Um, uh, my family was murdered in 1941. Uh, my Jewish family was murdered in 1941. Hamburg Jews were sent to uh, Minsk in Belarusia, where upon arrival uh, they were stripped and then shot and dumped into a mass grave. My grandmother was taken to <clears throat> by the by two Gestapo, who came uh, to my mother's apartment uh, and took her away the night before I turned six years old. The uh, from about the time I was three years old, I was aware that I was uh, the object of hate uh, of the German uh, of the. German government, the German country. It was made clear by, made clear by a play, uh, playmate who told me that she wouldn't play with me because I was a dirty Jew pig. I had no idea what, what she was talking about. The, as, uh, this horrific war against uh, Jews and Germans who uh, protested the Nazi regime, uh, progressed, uh, it uh, got worse. My mother had to go to the uh, Gestapo every week. Uh, the only reason we were not taken in 1941 was because my mother had married a non-Jew. Uh, and this saved us in 1941, uh, but in 1943, uh, the Nazis said that all Jewish spouses were to be exterminated as well. And in 1943, in the summer of 1943, my mother got uh, our deportation order to Theresienstadt. My mother tried to commit suicide uh, in the hopes that uh, my father's relatives would take in her children in the hope that she would uh, be able to save uh, her three daughters. She had sent me off to one of the relatives who was instrumental uh, in, uh, in helping us. Uh, but, and I had, never, I had not been allowed to be outside uh, since the Nazis uh, came to power. And it struck me as very odd, I was seven and a half, that she let me take my baby sister uh, to uh, my father's cousin. And I turned around and I found my mother with her head in the, in the gas oven. And I pulled her out. And my mother lived and uh, never had uh, another such moment and was <clears throat> uh, horrifically strong. R right after that, the Allies bombed the city of Hamburg. It was called Operation Gomorrah. The Brits are uh, bombed at night. The, uh, the Americans bombed during the day. It was a 10-day and 10-night uninterrupted bombing. My mother and I were not allowed in a bomb shelter. Uh, we were forced 
to run through flaming streets. The Allies dropped phosphorus, and I saw human beings jumping into, uh, into the lake and the canals uh, and coming up. They were like human candles. Their bodies were in flame, and every time they jumped into the canals and lakes, the flames would be uh, doused, but the minute they came up for air, they would be uh, in, in flames. As a seven-and-a-half-year-old, I saw more dead bodies burned to a crisp. Un uh, two things. I'm a pacifist, and it's just ironic that this horrific uh, revenge uh, attack on civilians, it was entirely targeted on civilians, uh, saved my life because there were so many burned bodies that could not be identified that I was able to go into—we were able to go into hiding. Uh, this was arranged. My father was in the underground. Uh, he had managed to uh, arrange for us to be hidden uh, in a sort of ex-urban farm outside the city of Hamburg uh, by communist uh, underground members of uh, the elderly couple who hid us were not uh, pro-Semitic, but they were virulently anti-Nazi, and uh, we were in hiding in a tar paper shack uh, when there were no people, when there were uh, no people around, when there were people around, we had to go hide in an earthen dugout. And on my eighth birthday, uh, on 19th November 1943, in the earthen dugout, I told my mother that if I lived, I would never, ever be quiet and that I wanted to become a peacemaker. Well, I've never—I've kept that promise. I have not been able to make—to uh, figure out how I can get governments to make peace, uh, but I continue to battle on all fronts. I have battled when I came to America. Uh, as a 17-year-old, I saw that America was a racist country, and I became active in the civil rights movement. I, uh, Marion, in, in part two yes. of our conversation, Sorry. we're going to talk about your history in the civil rights movement. Um, but just before we go to the Israeli-American genocide historian, um, uh, Omer Bartov, uh, just if you could share a message to the world um, about what never again means to you. To me, it would mean never again to repeat the horrors that we have uh, committed throughout my lifetime and of certainly uh, before that. Uh, nothing has been learned from uh, the atrocities uh, of the uh, mid-20th century, the continued atrocities in Vietnam, Iraq, and, and Afghanistan. Uh, We've been holding signs of you calling for a ceasefire. Yeah, I, I want more than that. I want peace. I'm disgusted at the fact that not a single nation, not a single leader has even mentioned that word, as though that is a word of uh, a dangerous word. There, there has to be a way of bringing together warring parties. When the Allies attacked Hamburg, Germany, thinking that that would weaken the uh, military uh, conflict, it only strengthened it. What uh, Israel is doing in, in Gaza, in the West Bank, and has been doing, is only going to strengthen uh, 
the uh, attack on Israel, or you cannot expect that people will be quiet after what uh, we've all witnessed. I say, yeah. stop, I stop <clears throat> this uh, madness. Yeah, I, I'd like to bring in Professor uh, Omer Bartov, uh, one of the uh, most uh, prominent uh, scholars of Holocaust and genocide studies. Uh, your sense, of uh, Professor Bartov, of what Israel is doing right now in Gaza? Uh, well, good morning, and thank you for having me. Um, look, what, what Israel is doing right now, according to its own uh, political leaders and military commanders, is um, attempting to destroy uh, Hamas, which is the, the hegemonic power in Gaza at the moment. And it claims to be doing it, A, uh, as retaliation for the heinous attack on October 7th, where over 1,000 civilians were butchered, and 240 people were kidnapped and are still kept in Gaza. Uh, but he claims to be doing it also um, because it it feels that without doing that, um, it would be um, permanently under threat uh, from that organization. So that's its own uh, position. The problem with this position is not only is the massive and excessive and disproportionate killing of civilians um, of, of Palestinian civilians in Gaza uh, during this operation, uh, but also that it doesn't have any clear political horizon. It is not clear what the day after would look like. And the, the reason the Israeli government does not want to talk about that is that um, it does not want to have any sort of compromise with the Palestinians. And that has been the policy of the Netanyahu administration, or many administrations, uh, for decades now. Uh, and Netanyahu actually uh, kept Hamas uh, quite strong and kept the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank quite weak, so that he could say that he could not find any representative of the Palestinians who would be willing to sit down and find a compromise while at the same time, uh, he was busy, he and of course, uh, the settlers who are now heavily represented in his government could keep uh, settling in the West Bank. So the larger context of this is that the refusal of the Israeli government to find any kind of compromise with the Palestinians, and frankly, the indifference of the large part, the majority of the Israeli population to the occupation is what led and keeps leading to this ongoing um, and, and increasingly uh, violent confrontation between Israel and the Palestinians. Professor Omar Bartov, uh, we're going to continue with part two of our conversation posted at democracynow.org. Brown University professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Uh, called by the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum one of the world's leading specialists on the subject of genocide. And Marion Ingram, 87-year-old Holocaust survivor, about to turn 88. We thank you for sharing your experience. I'm Amy Goodman, with Juan Gonzalez. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org give.